Good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Keep the Mic On. I am Simply Sherry, and if you have been here, you know that since the, since March of 2020, you notice we've stopped saying since the start of things. Since March of 2020, we have been here almost every Sunday in conversation with an artist, getting to know a little bit deeper, getting to know them, getting a little bit more into the process. We are excited. We took a break for the holiday, for the holiday last mm -hmm. weekend, whether you celebrate it or not, but we're back this week. My week is called From Behind the Microphone, where we take the time to get to know the person behind the art, which happens on third Sundays. So next week, come back and see me. Um, now is the time for you to let everyone know we are live on YouTube, on Facebook. Please like and subscribe in both locations. Help us get some some more looks and views. I'm trying to make sure I am not forgetting anything. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and kick it to the one, the only Kaniki Jakarta. Hello, good people. She already said be on, um, tell people, I guess tell your mama and them and all your friends that we are live <laughs> on Keep the Mic On every Sunday at seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So make sure you got the time right in things. My week is fourth week and it's called Poets and Platforms, where I interview poets who have platforms for all different types of art. And let me tell you, everybody that comes on here, we have been coined a masterclass. And if you haven't joined us before, go back and watch and you'll see why. And all of the people who join us, they join us for free, but these platforms are not free. So if you would like to support us, our Cash App is scrolling at the bottom of your screen. It is cash app. Keep the mic on. So contribute so we can keep, keep the, the mic, mic on. on. I'm saying holla. I'm going to kick it to the one, the only, they don't call her the girl genius for nothing. Some of y'all can't see me. You're, and, I, and I'll explain that some of y'all can't see me in a minute. Some of you can't see me and I'm doing the beauty queen wave. Hi, I am girl genius. It's a pleasure to be here with you this week. Uh, my week is called Let's Talk About the Dot, 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 Usually Books, but all things, you know, product and, and, and process and how we got from point A to point B. That is my week. I am first week of every month. I am so happy to be back with you this week. Yay. I will save, uh, and well, you know what? I'll make the announcement and then and, and pass it to Ms. Cayenne. The reason why I said some of y'all can't see me is because one of the lovely exciting updates we have for this week is uh, we are now on Spotify. So yeah. if you are listening to us, we are Keep the Mic On on Spotify. We have uh, uploaded previous episodes as podcasts. So if if podcasts are your thing or you just kind of want to listen in and run back information from the, you know, the comfort of your phone without having to, you know, watch a video or anything like that, if you want to you know, add us to your favorite podcast list. We are on Spotify and on Anchor FM as a, as a podcast now. So I will be loading more back ish back um, episodes as I get them. But um, several episodes from this season are up. Um, so I am super excited about that. And this one will be up shortly, uh, FYI. So there's that. Yay! That's my news for the week. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know it's been it's been a long time coming. It's just a lot to get these episodes up and going. <laughs> so that is yet another avenue where you can find keep the mic on, or like I said, if you want to run back your favorite show, drop some jewels, pass it along. Um, be sure to find us. And and for those of you who are not on Spotify, I promise you, I'm I'm working on Apple Music and some other things too, so that we our, our podcast will be on your favorite podcast listening station of choice. So there you go. Um, it, it's it's been it's been some time making this happen. So anyway, I am going to pass it on to Miss Cayenne. <laughs> so listen, guys, I am Miss Cayenne. I'm a poet, and I know it. My segment is called Passion Projects: The Root of the Why basically trying to delve a little deeper into the story of the artists, into their why, what causes them to keep doing what they're doing, why do they do what they do. And tonight I'm super, super excited 
to have that conversation with an all around creative Randy Preston. So let's 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 hear a little bit about who he is. Lend me your ears as I read his bio. All right. Randy Preston is a singer, songwriter, educator and storyteller who grew up on three different continents, raised in the UK and Kenya. He gained a deep appreciation for the language, lore and legends of the places he lived. This love of story and storytelling led to Preston performing in a live spoken word tour that ended up at La Mama's Experimental Theater in 1993. He wrote rings of poetry, gained a degree in English uh, literature and, a head and headlined a Christian rock band called Jacob's Night. Preston channeled all of that into an 18 year teaching career from the high school classroom to the university lecture halls. Recently, Preston has been fascinated with the stories and songs of his grandmother's tribe, the Piscataway people, a local native tribe indigenous to what is known as Maryland, US. He has combined all of these loves to create wild and wonderful presentations of music and myth and encouraging students all over the world to delight in valuing their own songs and stories. For much of the past six years, Preston toured internationally with Kwame Alexander, visiting thousands of students over 700 schools throughout six different countries and 48 of the 50 states, U.S. states, performing in auditoriums, theaters, and classrooms, a, memorial, a memorable inclusion were performances at the Coretta Scott King Awards 50th anniversary celebration in Washington, D.C. Preston has presented songwriting workshops with students of all ages throughout the U.S. and Europe and continues to be encouraged by the responses of students, parents, and teachers to his methods. Preston wrote original songs for the novels Rebound and Solo, for which he won an uh, ALA Audio Book Award in 2018. He wrote and performed original songs for the educational show Wordplay with Kwame Alexander, hosted by Adventure Academy. He also wrote original music for the ABC Mouse program, including the Happy Kwanzaa and Earth Day songs, celebrating the, tutor, uh, the titular holidays. Preston received, or recently rather, signed a two book deal with Penguin Books for his picture books. The first drum and what's that noise to be released in 2024. He was excited to perform in the new musical Acoustic Rooster's Barnyard Boogie starring Indigo Bloom, which debuted in November 2021 at the Kennedy Center, the theater for young audiences for which he composed the score. That show is scheduled for a national tour in January of 2023. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> it's a mouthful, and I can't wait to dive into all of the things, all of the things. But how you feeling? Now you can hear me, right? Yeah, yep, yep. I am doing well, other than awesome. forgetting to I'm good. I'm good, great. good. Thank you for being here. I'm going to exit for a second. So after reading all that, let the people at least get a taste of who this this guy is. I'm going to exit and let you do your thing. Sure. Thank you. Um, there was mention in the bio about the Piscataway people, and <clears throat> my grandmother is Piscataway. And uh, when I was in Canada a couple of years ago, they did a land acknowledgement. It was the first time I'd ever heard that, and it was very, very moving. So I've written the song um, to honor my ancestors here um, and to kind of acknowledge their existence. I'd, I'd like to uh, sing that and share that with you. It's called Our Rivers. From the shores of the Rappahannock By the mighty Patawoma On the banks of the Patuxent, my 
my people lived and loved and laughed and cried. My people lived and loved and learned and thrived. Oh, God. Hey, uh. From the sands of Chesapeake to the island of Chincoteague to Alicana in the West. My people lived and loved and took their rest. My people lived and loved and took their rest. Oh, you were not forgotten. No, we will not forget. Oh, you are not forgotten. Oh, 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 we will not forget. We will not forget. We will not forget. We will not forget. We will not. We will not forget. One is she, my friend. One is she. Wow. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. I almost feel like, you know, just a moment of silence because I in and and honoring and um the people of your grandmother. Grandmother, correct? Yeah. That's beautiful. I love the refrain, you are not forgotten. <laughs> I got a poem already from that one right there. That's beautiful. So how did you come to, were you uh, doing your own research or was that just, you know, how stories are being told and you, how did you come um, to start doing that, that, that deeper dive? That's a good question. Um, I didn't grow up here in the States. And so coming back to the States was fun because I got to come into contact with all the history that I had never really known. Excuse me. Um, growing up in England, being in Africa, those places have such rich histories that I was always interested. So when I came here, I was a college student and I just was doing college student things, living life. Um, as I got older, one of my cousins was doing some digging as well. And so he and I kind of put our heads together. We said, oh, what's going on? Um, I went and started checking out some of the uh, the powwows and the, the, the gatherings that the people were having. And I talked to people and it was interesting because um, and for good reason, I think they were a little bit standoffish. I was like, yeah. okay, that's fine, that's fine. Um, I went to another ceremony where they were thanking the Catholic Church. I think in 2013, between 2013 and 2015, 2018, um, we were given the right to be to, to say we're a tribe in the state of Maryland by the state. Um, it's mm. not a federally recognized tribe. Um, but the irony of that was that we were sitting in a Catholic church thanking the diocese for having kept good records, which is what we use to prove to the state we are wow. who we say we are. Wow. But they would not have believed us without those records. And I started getting mad. I was in there with my friend's, my friend's Cherokee dude, he's Mexican and Cherokee guy. He's like, let's go, man. Let's just leave. I was like, I'm so upset. That day I went to the power, to the, 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 the kind of celebration afterward. And, um, I spoke with a, a woman and I said, look, she's, I said, I'm looking for these people. And my friend had directed me to her, um, my friend named January. She's also in the tribe. Um, and so I'm speaking to this lady and I started showing her pictures of my grandmother and her family. She said, I know that lady. She said, that's my aunt. Oh, she said, wow. oh, because, and then, oh man, it was such a moment for me of belonging in a place where we are still not safe. And this is really my home. Like, this is really my home. 
but it, we're not safe here. Yeah, mm-hmm. No one's safe here um, of color. Uh, so that it, it's been an interesting experience to kind of examine and explore. Um, I've gotten in touch with some of the elders in the tribe. Um, the men and the women have brought um, one of my old re- relatives. She was about 92 when I took her. And she, we met some of the women in the tribe. And she knew people that they didn't know, which was really cool. Yeah. Uh, he thought I was messing around. I'm, I'm for real. I'm, so, <laughs> you know, I'm happy to be a part of that experience. I haven't formally joined the tribe yet. Um, okay. My cousins have. Um, so I'm like, I kind of like, uh, what do I have to prove? Like, come on, I'm, I'm here. But it would be a good thing to do, I think, just so that I can vote in the tribal councils and stuff on the meeting. Wow, what does that entail to become a part of the tribe officially? Give them my birth certificate and tell them who I am. Okay. And give them proof that I am related to blah blah blah, and okay. this bloodline is the one. It's matrilineal, so yeah. you just go to your mom's line because they can always you can always know your mother is right. So right, um, <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's, that's the thing, right? Matrilineal tribes. Like, you know we may not know the pop, but we know the well, mom. You may so, know the mamas. <laughs> right. it's, it's a powerful thing um, to honor that, though. I think to just honor the that sacrifice of childbirth in such a way. That that is, you know, definitive proof. Ah, anyway, yeah. But um, it's been an interesting exploration, and I'm grateful that I live here, and I'm probably going to be living here for a while, because I'm not leaving again. Um, they tried to move us out of here um once before, and everyone people started coming back. They were like, "Nah, this is our home." So I'm not leaving again. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Okay, gotcha. Huh. So. Just for chronological journey sake, mm-hmm. it's, it talks about being was raised in the UK and in Kenya, but where were you born? I was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I think I was born in Harrisburg General Hospital. I believe that's the name of the hospital. <laughs> or Harrisburg, I don't know. I, I, I should yeah. know. Yeah, it's but probably- I, I was in Huh? Yeah, I was thinking. I was laughing because I was born in Queens General. You just right. add a general to the, to the general, city. Yeah, you're pretty much there, you know what's what it is. Yeah, um, yeah. we moved to okay. uh, Virginia Beach soon after that, and um, when I was six, we moved to London. So, uh, gotcha. or to a little north of London, to a town called Watford, and um, I went to school there. And so all my schooling until high school, until the until college was in either England or in Kenya. So I was in Kenya for a year. My parents wow. said, you can, work, you can go back to the States. You finish high school. You can go back to the States and do a year there before you go to college because I was 15. And or you can go to Kenya. I was like, why? Do you know me at all? Like, why would you ask me? Let's just go. Where are the tickets? I'm there. Let's go today. Right, let's go. Oh, man, I enjoyed it. It was a really good year. And I have friends that I've, you know, friends I made in, in, in school in England as well. But um, in Kenya, that I still have today, and there, you know, we're, was that a military move or was that something my else related? Was a pastor. My father's a Seventh Day Adventist minister, so we were traveling all over the world. Yeah, doing the Lord's work. It was good. Right, <laughs> right. I knew that, but I wanted the people to know because they're probably thinking, "Oh, he's a military kid." Right. But that's awesome. So, oh my gosh, I have so many questions. Let me let me slow myself down. So many questions. So I'm thinking now. I'm I'm trying to imagine a young. Uh, male, uh, creative, living in various countries, um, parents who are doing the Lord's work. How does, and you talked about kind of harnessing your experiences and adventures, right? Living abroad and and, and into an 18 year uh, long uh, tenure of teaching. How did you, in what way was those, some of those experiences woven into your teaching tenure? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, that's, that's a good question. Let me think about that. Um, I think the, you know what I, I had in every place that I was, I had one or two really, really good teachers. And I really do believe that the education that I got in the British, British educational system was very, very good. Okay. Um, they were streaming us at that point. This was in the, um, the middle of the eighties. So they were like, oh, you're smart. We're putting you in a different group. And right. so that's what happened. And, and I got to learn German and French. And we took physics and not only biology, you know. So there were all these little things that we were doing. Um, and our history teacher was amazing. Um, I think his name is Mr. M- uh, oh, man, I had it in my head. I was going to say Mr. Moore, but that wasn't it. I have to ask my friends. But he was awesome. He was really awesome. And, and I really grew to love history. And 
I was reading a lot and learning the history of the places because I always wanted to know where I was. I was like, where am I in the world? So I'd study that stuff. But um, I think that hmm. being around really good teachers, having great teachers, my mother is a teacher. She's an excellent teacher. My grandmother is an excellent teacher. My father is a preacher and he is also a teacher. So right. just being around all those people. Um, I, I, my sisters are both psychologists. You know, my brother works in IT. He, he, he does stuff where he's helping people. Everyone, all of us are doing things where we help people. So yeah. um, I think that just being around missionaries, being around people who yeah. are working for God, um, um, being around people who are interested in others' uh, success and, and others being happy and, and ultimately their, you know, their, 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 uh, their spiritual end, you know, that, that kind of makes you look at the world from a perspective of saying, okay, what can I do? To make this better what can i do yeah. to add something and yeah. um yeah yeah so I, I don't know if that answered your question that was such a good question i don't know if I answered yeah that. no that's awesome because i think when i think about teaching because i know you taught high school because i think that's when i met you you we were teaching high school in southeast dc um so to me that's a that's a work of service <laughs> yeah. i was a high yeah. school teacher too that yeah. is a work of there's a labor of love <laughs> in communities that are underserved exactly um, you know the last school that i taught at in southeast was in um was in a neighborhood that kids thought called third world and they were like we from third world i was like okay that's yeah that's yeah, okay um yeah. and it was very it was you know it was poverty stricken um mm -hmm. there was a giant across the street in maryland that people could go to but that was the closest thing that anybody in southeast had to vegetables you know, yep. kids are coming to school eating hot Cheetos and blue drink. And and I, I need you to sit down and pay attention. Maybe you didn't sleep last night. Maybe, you know, they were fighting next door. Maybe they were shooting in the street and you couldn't come to school for the last couple of days like that. You know, seeing that and, and, and being away, being seven, six miles from the White House. You know, I was teaching when Obama was president. And I'm like, yeah, we got it. Something has to change and it hasn't. So, um I absolutely adore teaching. I won't ever be able to do it again because I had a stroke as a result of a lot of things that were going on in my life, including wow. the stress of what we were experiencing. We lost a couple of the kids the year. Um, one of the teachers, he died in some suspicious circumstances. Another teacher had a nervous breakdown. It was an interesting time. So um, the stroke wiped me out and I could not teach anymore. And so, um, that's why I'm doing this. But uh, yeah. yeah, if I hadn't had that happen, I probably would still be in the classroom. And really? Yeah. That was the pivotal moment um, for you. The, you know, having that physio physiological response to the pressure and to the weight. Yeah. Oh, and I, it I could... twisted your whole whole trajectory, seems like. Yes. I, would, we, I would drive home. I remember this clearly. I remember one day I was in the subway, there's a subway down there um, off of, I don't know if it's 210. Um, yeah, Southern but, Avenue. Uh, or Congress. There's Congress, there's Congress Heights and there's Southern Avenue. Those are the closest to, yeah, to that area. Into, um, South Capitol Street. So it's 210, it turns into South Cap by Eastover yeah. Mall. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. So there's a subway in Eastover. And I was in that subway and I'd seen this homeless dude before. There's a lot of homeless people. It was near the summer. It was when school was out. I'm doing stuff in the classroom or whatever. Um, right before, you know, the kids are all gone though. Um, and I'd seen this guy and I hadn't given him money because he never asked me, but he was in the subway and he was like, hey, um, can I get some food? I was like, sure. And I, I, you know, I, I was like, what do you want? Get your order. I had him come up with me. I said, go take a seat, man. I'll pay for it. Just take, take, you know, take your time. I'm going to come eat with you. And I was in the line and he looked at me and he said, you know, he was sitting, he was sitting, it's a small place. so It wasn't very far away. He was sitting close to me. He said, you know, I used to have my own place. And I used to, I used to have my own, my own stuff, you know, yeah. and, oh man, he's right around the same age as my dad. And he kind of resembled my dad or, or one of my dad's cousins or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. It, it, it just hit me so hard wow. that this man was suffering and I couldn't help him. Like, I can't, what do I do? I can buy him a sandwich. You know, what am I, I'm, I'm stressed out. I, I don't have gas money to get to school. I'm paying for kids to have apples because they haven't eaten anything in a couple of days except for the school lunches. They don't like those. You know, I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, what? And I'm driving to my house. And the only problem I have out where I live is 
deer hitting my car. Like this is literally a problem for me. So that was, you know, constant, the juxtaposition of, yeah. and hmm. then right next to absolute fatality, you know, violence, somebody got shot outside the school that happened more than once. Kids are like, look, it happened already. We can go home now. There's nothing going on. Everybody left and these teachers are freaking out. And that, it, that's stress. That's stress. Yeah, and that's the children dealing with this, you know? So yeah, it was, I, you know, I, I have a much love for teachers and I have much love for teachers who are in the hood. I, my hat is off to you. Thank you for your sacrifice because yeah. it is a sacrifice and yeah. the children and the young people remember that they don't forget that nope. they don't forget that. Um, so yeah, am I off of my soapbox? Sorry. I just no, I get it. I get it. I mean, and, and when I was teaching in Baltimore city, um, and that was during the time of the wire, which everybody was like, is that really happening? You know, but I was like, yeah, I, that's, that's kind of real stuff. Mm -hmm. And so some of the stories that you're sharing, I could, I could relate, you know, I would be afraid to watch the news because I didn't want to see one of my kids on the news or, um, kids would come to school and school was the safe haven for them. So when school was out, professional development day, they, they would still show up to school. You know, I was like, oh my God, you know, things like that. But, and I we used to call it the trenches. We used to call it working in the trenches. But I think even that was like, that was some time ago and I'm looking, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, I, I don't have the capacity for that anymore. But yet I know we have to be, somebody has to be there. Someone has to do it and someone has to have the grace to do it because otherwise, we would ultimately leave our children in the war zone without any, you know, without anything, without any uh, food, without metaphorically and physically speak, without any nourishment, metaphorically and physically and actually. So you're right. It's hats off and to our teachers, particularly those teaching in underserved communities, because it's literally the lifeline of hope for many of our. Of and our, and it's so necessary. I, um, I was I always talk to the teachers because a lot of my friends are teachers and we're always yeah. like, what would we do differently? What would we change? And, you know, I'll be, I'm almost 50 and there, I should not, if I were teaching right now, if I was in education right now, there's no way that I should be in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, at, at, at probably like 45, I think teachers should be teaching from maybe the age of 28. I don't think people who not are. Enough. Three or twenty-two should be teaching eighteen-year-olds at all. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> yeah, I, I would watch teachers, male teachers, not have problems with the girls, but have problems with the boys. A mm. bravado, you know. I'm feeling like, man, you challenging me. Like, yeah. You know, I was thirty-five or thirty-six. I was like, bro, you better sit down. Somebody <laughs> challenge somebody. You ain't challenging me, and I would laugh. You know, <laughs> if I was younger, I know I would have probably popped off too. Or right. I'm a little upset. What you trying to say? I'm a teacher. Right. You know, that's. So I, I think that I could be forestalled with uh, having teachers be a little older, but then I also think that in order to really relate to these children, you have to be separate, separated by age. Mm. That helps. Mm -hmm. Too far away makes it hard for the kid to relate. So, you know, 26, 27, maybe perfect. Right. Um, and then about 37 moving into administration, give it 10 years, do it for 10 years because it's such a grueling thing. It's so yes. hard. I know yes. so many wow. people, who have just, you know, taken a financial hit, taken a, 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 a health hit, serving their community. Um, yeah, I, I, just, I think there should be a cap on stuff. I think you'd be like, yeah, I give it, you know, 10 or 12 years in the classroom. That's a good point. A mentor teacher, and your job is to not go to schools and teach teachers how to deal with it. That's your job. And then if you want to keep doing it, you'll be, you know, assistant principal or dean and then the principal. So yeah, I, I just think that the way we do it is, is um, based on a system uh, modeled after some of the oligarchical systems we see running a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So top down, this person's a leader. You know, I mean, come on, man. Everybody, if, if you've taught in a classroom, you know how to do it. If you've done it for a couple of years, if you've done it for 10 years, you're good at it. You, you should teach other people how to do it now. But that's, you know, that's not what they think about. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. e education is a very interesting place I, for multiple reasons. There's bureaucracy, there's territorialism, there's there's so many different nuances on top of the stuff that's going on in the classroom. Um, Help children <laughs> con consciously 
navigate the world. Exactly. It's, 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 it's like, complicated. They need to know this stuff. Like they need to know. So, yeah. yeah. It's complicated. So, everyone knows. Well, I don't know if everyone knows, but let's talk about, you know, um, Kwame Alexander and Randy Preston. I, 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 in my little notes here, I said the the dynamic duo, the partners, the yeah. the partners and creative genius, so to speak. Can you talk to us a little bit about? Um, you've done several projects with him, but kind of, I guess, walk us through. I think for the last seven years or so, you've been w- working with him intently, kind of exclusively to some degree. So, can you talk us talk to us a little bit about those projects and how, and your partnership with um, Kwame? The, sure. sure. The writer <laughs> absolutely absolutely um so I, i've known kwame since i think i was 19. Um, oh wow okay yeah. <clears throat> he produced a uh, a show called the weight of being black it was a spoken word show and i think i mentioned it in my bio I, yeah the problem was in there but kwame produced that um the first time we did it um at the gunson arts theater in arlington virginia um mm-hmm. gunson performing arts theater, um theater in Gun- uh, gunson hall or something like that um, he, he knows it perfectly. He'd be like, oh, this is what it is. He, he's got a good memory for that kind of stuff. But that's when I met him. And then I knew he was writing books. Um, from that time, he was writing poetry books. And you know, I was into poetry. We were doing open word slams and stuff. And so, you know, we were a part of the community. And then um, his wife and my sister were in school together. Um, so then he was around the house. So I've known him for years. Um, when I was teaching, probably two years before I stopped, um, he hit me up. He was like, yo, I know you're writing. You know, you, you know, he's still writing. I was like, I'm teaching English, bro. I'm writing all the time because I write with the kids. Um, he's like, yo, you should come to Brazil. We're doing a fellowship. I was like, okay. He said, apply here. I was like, perfect. It was his fellowship, but I apply. I was thinking I had to apply for some board of, I'm working on my letter and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was his joint. So I was like, oh, okay. So we went over there. It was great. We were, we were jamming. I brought my guitar. Um, I take my guitar with me everywhere I go. So um, we're playing in these in these uh, these Brazilian little coffee shops and nightclubs and stuff. And, wow. and you, know, you know, I remember one night there were these angry Brazilian poets, and they I mean they have a real reason. They were real. You know, we're in Bahia, which is the black part of Brazil. Um, a lot of activism, a lot of angry folks. So <laughs> they were like, oh, they were like you know, spitting the mic and stuff. Just and we were like, oh yeah, we had no idea what they're saying. We don't support these. <laughs> and we got up and played some love song, and they were looking at us like crickets, like. <laughs> Blink, 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 blink. We had fun. It was great. Um, and then uh, after I had the stroke, I didn't know what to do. And um, and my girlfriend at the time, she called me. She said, "Your friends on the radio." And I'd been praying. I was like, "God, what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do?" I'd heard oh, I'd heard three words: right, 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 in my head. I was like, "Okay." Called my mom immediately. I was like, "Mom, this is what God told me." She's like, "Okay." And she wrote it down in her book, and I know she has it. Um, I knew I wouldn't be. I wasn't crazy. I was like, "Let me verify that this took place." <laughs> Um, and then my ex girlfriend called me. Was like, your friend is on was on the radio. I was like, my friend. She was, yeah. I was like, who? She was the Kwame guy, the guy you went to Brazil. I was like, oh wow, okay. I was like, where's he? And so I, I turned NPR on and I heard him. I was like, the Newberry. Yes, he won the Newberry. And I'd heard he'd won it the year before, but I hadn't. I'd been having a stroke and dying, yeah. you know, like yeah. coming back to life and everything. So um, I was like, yo, my man. So I hit him up immediately. I was like, yo, what's up? He was like, hey, what's good, man? He says, I'll be in town. Um, I'll be at Politics and Prose doing a thing for some kids from a school come through. I was like, perfect. He said, bring your guitar. Maybe we'll jam like we did in Brazil. I was like, that's perfect. So we were like, all right. So I brought my guitar. Um, this was in March. February is when I was like, I quit teaching. Um, I was like, I can't do this. This is when God told me, right. I was like, yeah. okay. Um, and I started writing. I'd actually started writing some poetry and some books, but I, I didn't really know what I was writing for or who I was going to give them to. Wow. But um, okay. yeah, so I went to politics and prose that day. He was like, come on the road with me. I was like, all right. And so we started, we, started <laughs> we, started traveling, we traveled, we visited over a thousand schools. Um, we've been to, oh man, 10, 12 different countries. Um, we just jammed out. Um, a lot of the, we've done a lot of really good projects. Um, we did a couple of projects with music where we, where I wrote songs for his books. That's kind of where a lot of the stuff started. And then I would go with him and, you know, the kids' books, Surf's Up, you know, uh, yeah. these books that he's written, I just wrote music for them and we'd jam it out and the kids would have fun. Um, and that's and then we started being more intentional with his other books, um, the, uh, the, the middle grade novels, the novels in verse. 
I was writing, you know, songs that accompanied these pieces yeah. um, or music that would go along with the novel and verse. And, you know, he'd have a, he'd have a poem and then maybe I just beat on my guitar to a rhythm and he's rapping it. Or maybe I make a little jazz thing and we pull the teacher up and now the teacher's rapping the song from the book and the kids. Wow. Are like, so that kind of stuff is really fun. And I think what we realize is that children really respond um, to music for this generation there is not anything that they do that they enjoy that does not have music attached to it. Uh -huh. So anything that they consume that they like, and there's music to it, except for school. School, they sit there and there's a woman. <laughs> Charlie <laughs> Brown. Everything else has music to it, like a video game, the reels, YouTube, everything. There's a soundtrack and there's something else that, that helps them emotionally connect with this thing. So um, we were like, all right, this works. So the music helps. It helps the kids to connect. Um, when they're singing along, um, you know, I write a lot of songs for kids because I want them to sing along. When they sing along, now they're adding to the creation of this moment. Music is, music is a divine thing and creating is a divine thing. And when we create together, we touch a kind of divinity that nothing else, um, there's nothing like it when people sing together or play music together uh. or speak in a chorus together, do things in unison. There is a power to that that children tap into, and they uh, love it. And so when we're when we do our thing, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, we've done, um, we did a, he did a TV show called uh, Wordplay with Kwame Alexander. I did all the music for that. Um, yes. That was fun. We did that with ABC with a uh, uh, Adventure Academy, um, right. and uh, and then we've been I've been writing some other songs with ABC Mouse. Um, you know, the whole thing is allowing children the access to the song. Allowing mm -hmm. the children access to singing with the song, and then writing something that they want to sing. Yeah. And then, and then, we, then we've we've come we've done what we we wanted to do because anything that you put under that kind of music, they're going to remember. So paint this picture for me because um, I'm a little removed from uh, younger audiences. Well, uh, of late, this summer I have been reconnected, but of, of prior to that, I've been a little bit removed. So in my mind. I think this is phenomenal. I, and I'm like, maybe I've just been missing it. To, to a, When I read it, it sounds weird to me, but it's awesome to say that you write the songs for this novel. Because in my mind, a novel is words in a book. Yeah, yeah. It, it never connects to music unless they make it a movie and then there's a right. soundtrack. Right. right. So when I'm reading this, I'm like, well, all these all movies? No, they're books. So you so am I my are you you're traveling, you're doing presentations in schools and auditoriums, a company and you're playing and you're doing these activities with them. Now, when a person purchases a book, let's say rebound right. or solo or what have you, is there just a book? Well, actually, the, the one book that we did that with was solo. Okay. And solo is a story of a kid who's a musician. And so I was like, yeah, let me write some songs. He's like, yo, why don't you write some songs? We were, we were like, yo, this is a great idea. Right, right. So I wrote songs for the character. Um, and they're working on optioning that. So we're going to see if that's going to be picked up by some studios, yeah. which would be really cool. But um, we did that. Um, we did that one. But most of the stuff that I do is really for presentation. It's just for okay. it's to kind of go along with what it's doing. Um, uh, there's another... There's a there's a book that we really kind of fashioned a presentation for, um, and that is really nice. But it's a it's a picture book called Undefeated, mm -hmm. um, and so we've done. There are actually pieces that we've kind of composed. I've composed the music. He's saying the words within the context of the song, um, and then we're you know presenting that. So that is kind of you know, we probably could could do it recording that stuff. I, I just. We've been doing a lot of things, and so yeah. and then the pandemic <laughs> shut everything down. It's like, uh, I mean, I was supposed yeah. to be, I was supposed to have gone to Australia and met the Aborigines, man. I was like, I'm excited, pandemic, boy, pandemic. So we stopped it. So I was upset, yeah. but you know, um, we are kind of revving back up a little bit. Sounds We're like trying it, to get yeah. things going again. So we'll see. Um, we'll I see. saw a picture of you. I was I'm trying to see if I can share it, but I'm I'm very sketchy when I'm not strong on my on my in, on my technical skills. I'm not gonna do it. But I saw a picture of you on stage, acoustic uh, <laughs> guitar. You were the rooster, right? You were the uh, the rooster, and the, and the play. First of all, the um, 
the the costuming was beautiful and then you were just so into it so i was like wait so we're gonna add to this list okay teacher songwriter world traveler i said now now you're well you probably have been doing that anyway but i didn't know stage uh actor on this i mean this the list keeps growing and growing no, it's, and it's growing. all the same thing it's all the same thing get up in front of people <laughs> and try to tell them something that's it it's the same yeah. stuff it's, yeah. you just have to do it slightly differently yeah you know when you're acting you got to say the way it's written in the script which I was like, I really don't want to say this. Like, I want to. They wrote the script. Kwame Mayer wrote the script, right? And so, <laughs> I know what they wrote because I was with them writing it. I was like, right. okay, I don't want to say it that way. I want to say it. So I was like, I want to stop being rebellious and just do the thing. But uh, you know, teaching again, you're up in front of kids. If you can make them laugh, if you can, I would whip my guitar out um, at the end of class. Oh, are you gonna play? Yeah, I'll leave it right here. And if we get through this someplace, okay, okay. Now they're all focused. You know. Um, performance wow. uh, uh connecting wow. yeah you know make, letting someone understand something through the creative process or through the create the, yeah. the creation of something um so wow. yeah, acting you know I've, I've been doing it for years um i did it when i was 16 i did a show um at the kenya national theater and i had the only speaking role and it was a, a story of the life of christ and so we had all these songs it's called the witness it's a beautiful play it's some really good music yeah. Um, but I was saying all these songs, that was Peter, but I was like old Peter. And so I just narrated the whole thing and uh, I was 16. So that was the first time I did anything like that. And when I came here, I did the plays here. I was always in college plays. And so I've been acting for a while, but I just, you know, I preach sermons. You're acting too, you know, you're teaching right. class, you're, acting, you know? Right. You're, you're presenting a performance. Presenting. You exactly. in a show, like if I'm playing with my band, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying things that I would normally say in conversation. That's true. You know, I'm saying, hey, let's have big fun. Everyone's like, big fun. What's that? Why would I ever say that? You know, they're jumping around now. Okay. That never happens in regular conversation. So, you know, there's there's performance mode for I think a lot of things. And so yeah. it kind of but that yeah. play was awesome. That play was amazing. I'm just really, really glad that I was involved with it. Yeah, it it look I'm 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 thinking to myself today, I was like, Man, I'm sorry that I did not see that. But you're there's a national tour schedule. Is that that's still in the works for so in January, as if I'm if I'm not mistaken, and I have to be careful because I don't know if this is set in stone, but it's supposed to be in January, um, sometime in January or February, they will be doing a run at the Kennedy Center again. That's okay, awesome. Um, and then the tour opens up. So okay, see, you know, the tour, yeah, so. that's good. That means I have another opportunity. Well, I'll just, I'll figure it out regardless. But I was like, that's another opportunity because it looks it looks extremely um, fun. And, I, and inviting, so I encourage audience members, check it out. What is, the, about, what is the title, full title? The title is Acoustic Rooster's Barnyard Boogie, starring Indigo Bloom. Yes. So we took a couple of books that Kwame wrote and mashed them up. Mm -hmm. And so it's really the story of Indigo Bloom, who has, who finds out that she has to do something and she gets a case of stage fright. Mm. And then she goes to sleep. And when she wakes up, she's in the in the world of her favorite storybook and those characters help to guide it ah duck so, ellington, <laughs> duck ellington um, chicky minaj oh okay chicky minaj. Minaj. <laughs> uh, i'm trying to oh do i not remember the characters come on mules davis um, yes I mules and, davis. um oh no the cow miss dairy parton very hard. I remember yeah. that. So yeah. That's so, hilarious. Uh, super fun. It's about an hour and five minutes. Okay. Um, we have to make it a little shorter, I think, um, for the tour. But um, I wrote like thirty-two songs, but we only used like twenty-eight of them. But wow. um, it was super fun. Uh, mm -hmm. The songs I wanted to make the songs sweet and happy, um, and I, I I tend to be a little bit of a purist. I like music to sound like music no matter yeah. who it's for. So yeah. I want it to sound like jazz, or I want you to be able to identify the genre of yeah. the kid's song that we're playing. Um, wow. I don't want it to be, you know, just, I, and, and no disrespect to these folk who do it, but I don't want it to, I don't want what I write to be something on a synthesizer that has bells and tinkling things. Mm. I, that isn't for me what music for mm. kids sound, should sound, could sound like. I think music for kids should sound like music for adults. Yeah. Why not? You know, like, <laughs> Literally, the kids kids are just adults with no experience with anything and less pain. Like, that, <laughs> just like sitting around 
they like the same <laughs> stuff. You like the same stuff you did when you were a kid. Like that, yeah. that doesn't change. So yeah, um, giving them quality, like really thought out. Yeah. Well, well orchestrated. Um, I work with a musical director in, on this piece and Mark Meadows. Amazing. Um, amazing. Uh, Lillian Brown, the director. Amazing. I mean, the yeah. people that I, I, I'm, I was, I was blessed. I was honored to be working with such brilliant professionals. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was really excited about it. And the main character, we wanted to make sure the main character was a, a dark skinned black girl. Mm. Um, I noticed you know, that, yeah. And we wanted to make sure that the family was intact and they were happy. Yeah. And we see that. Um, mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that uh, this was not anything that made made black people look remarkable. We want. I want. I, we wanted to write oh. a that would just be black people dealing with regular stuff. Regular stuff. Like, black people so, are people yeah. too. <laughs> black people are people too. <laughs> yes, we don't have to be in the middle of a gang fight in every story. We don't have to have somebody who's, oh my God, Nancy's pregnant. Oh no, it doesn't have to be like that. Mm. We can tell stories about, hey, you know what? I lost my ball and I had to look for it all day and I found it. Yay. Like, okay, that happens, you know? <laughs> so, um, I really, I, I'm very proud of, of that play. I, I'm very excited that it's going you know, to go on this tour. And I hope that um, the, the, uh, the actors were amazing. Um, the lead actor, uh, uh, she, was, um, she was playing Indigo Bloom. Um, and she said to me, a little girl, these two little girls came in African garb and they uh, they were beautiful and they said you 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 look your hair looks like our hair. And she said, Yeah. She said, and, and your hair is beautiful. She said, and you look like us too. And that broke us down, you know. It, it, I, I was like, oh, we were all like, oh my God, no, that's what it's for. Like, you know, representation for, for yeah. we learn that way. That's how humans learn. Yeah. We learn by watching. You, you never, you didn't learn by someone, say, you didn't learn English by someone saying, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe you did not. Most people don't learn their first language by sitting down and having someone say, hey, this is a verb. Hey, this is a noun. Do it this way. You learn by observing and by trying experimenting mm -hmm. being wrong yeah you know, we wasn't going no you don't say it wasn't you say we we weren't going oh exactly. we wasn't. No, okay try to say it again like it. it's not anything that we're we're sitting down formally and doing. we're just we're just paying attention to the world and learning and we ignore the fact that kids learn that way and when we give them role models we give them ways of coping like you know in in the in the play she has a panic attack and i wrote a song where she has a panic attack and then her mom says okay let's do some deep breathing we're giving kids solutions to stuff that happened mm. that i experienced as a kid this is stuff that um mary experienced as a kid um performing and being nervous and getting up and not being able to do it and and that's real and kids experience that so you know looking at real experiences and and relevant things that kids go through writing songs that i mean we have 12 genres of music. Um, I have a go-go song because we in DC, we don't have a go-go song. Right, right. We got a bunch of blues songs. We got a gospel song. Um, yeah. You know, we got, uh, we have some English folk melodies. We got everything in there. Wow. Um, and I hope, and I believe that Mark and this amazing band and I were able to create something that, that was clear, create music that was clear enough yeah. uh, stylistically and genre specific to be able to be understood and, and, and seen that way because I, I, I think kids need to be exposed to classical music. They need to be exposed to jazz. They need to be exposed to these things because that's the world. That's This is the art we have. Let's give them the art. Right. So that's a great segue because that was, and guys, I, I see you commenting, continue to comment and, and put, go ahead and start putting questions in the in the chat if you have them. This is the thing. I, this is just dissecting your bio. We really need to dive into the why, right? Because you're so, you're so chopped filled with so many different things, which is a great segue for me anyway, which you, 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 you've talked a lot about so far, you know, working with young people, children, whether in a classroom, the books with uh, Kwame Alexander, the music, that children can relate to, can connect with. You talked about how music 
everything that a child is exposed to generally, except for a school. Has been, so you talked a lot about that. So the question I have for you, um, because I'm wondering if this is part of this answer, is, you know, what is your what is your why, Randy? Because and what I mean by that is you're clearly a creative and and when I use that term, I'm I'm talking really you, everything that you've been talking about, you know, the writing, the music that I do this, I do that. And it's been a part of your life, even even living in different uh, on different continents and different countries. Um, to me, that's a creative way that life has been given to you because you're exploring the world in a different way. So what would you say is your why? What keeps you writing music? Now, leaving a classroom due to medical reasons of stress. But interestingly enough, you've into, entered into a, a shift that you're traveling all over the world. Traveling is stressful, you know, traveling and doing things. But somehow there seems to be a different grace for you. So what keeps you doing all of these wonderful things? What is your why? Um, that is a great question. I think it's my purpose in life. Uh -huh. um, when I was a child, I asked my father, what is a calling? Like you hear about this in church, you know, there's a calling on your life. Like, what, what is that? Like, what is that? Like, I, I don't know what that means. He, looked, he, he was, my dad is a very good teacher. He's very patient. He says, well, he said, I think that a calling, he says, this is my definition of it. It may not be what everybody else's is. He says, but my definition is that a calling is something that where you see a need, that's a calling. If you see a need, that's a calling. Because if you see a need, maybe no one else saw that need. And if you see a need, then God has equipped you to fill it. Mm. So that's the calling. And and um so yeah, I I I believe this is I mean, I don't want to sound too esoteric, but I believe that the stroke that I had um was a a death of, of something. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and literally I have a dead spot in my brain. Mm. And so I, part of me has died. Now that sounds really macabre and whatever, but it's true. And I, I, I think <laughs> no, that way. And so now I'm in a new place because that part of my brain, I lost words. I lost, I had aphasia, so I didn't know certain words, words are my life words. Mm. Are, that's my literal bread and butter. And I lost those words. So there's something about me that died and in living again and in trying to reformulate uh, an identity, a, a professional identity, a, a sense of who I am in the world. Um, yeah, I, I asked God, he said, right. He said, right. He said, do it, create, do the thing now, just do this thing. And um, so I write music, I, I write poetry, I'm writing a novel, I've written some kids books, so I'm writing, I'm, I'm doing it. Yes. And I think that probably for the first time in my life, there is an absolute peace about what I'm doing. Mm. There's an absolute peace. I don't have any doubt. Even when I was teaching, I was like, it was, I was like, is this, well, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm dying out here. Like this is, I'm overweight. I'm, I'm drinking coffee to keep my mind open. I'm trying, I'm, I'm getting to school at five in the morning, leaving at nine at night. Um, I'm grading on, I like, this is, I, this is crazy. This isn't living. This is this is work, uh, and so yeah. um, you know now I have a chance to live. You know I have an opportunity to live. I have an opportunity to be in a position where um, the things that I my imagination. You know I have ADHD. You know I, I suffer from all the anxiety, depression, everything, all this stuff, um, and all these things. When I look at them from the positive perspective, are things that help me be creative. Uh -huh. so, literally i'm doing what i'm supposed to do that's my why like this is the reason this is why i'm here um sounds very hubristic almost like you know like i'm beating my chest or something but i believe i'm this is why i'm here like this is the reason i'm on the planet that's why i didn't die i was driving 80 miles an hour in my car i had a stroke the whole freeway tilted 45 degrees and i was like man i should be flipping what's going on and wow. i was if i Correct. I would have died if I'd done anything weird. I'd have died. And I looked out of the window. Everything melted. Everything was literally melting, like in those, you know, in the mid, in those, uh, those kid shows. It's like, right, right. but it was just from my eyes. I was like, something's wrong. I was like, help me. 
the road opens up and I get over to the right lane and I'm able to get into the shoulder. It's a 730 in the morning down by Brand- by uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Mm-hmm. That joint is usually chock full of cars. Yes. Well, I was doing 80 miles an hour. I am. I should. I, I could. There is a chance that I could not be here. Wow. But I'm, I am here and I'm in my right mind. I didn't lose anything. They told me you may not be able to play your guitar. Or, I was like, yo, I didn't play my guitar for like two weeks after I came from the hospital. Cause I was like, if I can't play my guitar, what am I going to do? Like, ah, you know, this is part of who I am. So, you yeah. know, I, yeah, I can walk, I can see, and I haven't, I haven't lost my vision. I haven't, I lost, I couldn't see at a certain point. I, I went wow. blind on my way to the hospital. Like all that stuff was real. Um, but for whatever reason, and I'm grateful for it, I'm here. So yeah. yeah. I'm gonna do what God tells me. Like, right? Wow. Okay. Thank you. I'm writing. I'm gonna do whatever. You... Okay. All right. Yeah, you got my attention. I'm gonna do it today. So that's. What I'm Ooh, that's powerful because, you know, and uh, that's powerful because you, when asking what your why is, it's so interesting. I never heard it phrased that way, but I get it. A, a calling is where you see a need, and you know how, and I. From when you said that, what what came to me was there are things that, um, what's the word I want to use? Things that I see, right? Situations, circumstances, and and then there are things that I see that move me to action. I I I I can't not say or do something, and if I do try to say or not do something, then I have angst. Right, and and right. then I'll talk to people and they're like, they're not moved the way I'm moved about this thing. I'm like, can't you say, you know, right. and they're like, that's not my battle. That's not my, and now I get that. So the needs that yours, that, that you see in your eyes, that, that you're mm-hmm. drawn to, that moves you unto action mm-hmm. is the calling. It's the right. call is calling you to it. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's a powerful visual for me anyway, to be able, um, to be able to understand that and to even explain that to others. And so even the simplicity, but the powerfulness of right, right, right. And here you are doing just that. Um, oh, and, and you know what? I have not um, had a formal job for six years. I was going to say, I was, I was just about to go there. Yeah. Everything you need is right there because you're doing, God. exactly. <laughs> you're doing what he said to do. You. Yeah. You have the grace for the things that come along with what he said to do. Cause it's not, I think people th- think that, oh, it's roses everywhere, but there's still, you still have to work and grind, you know, be disciplined to write. <laughs> I'm writing a novel about a boy um, named Timo the liar. And mm. Timo um, is 14 and his one number one goal in life is to finish this trek that he's on that will allow him to change his status from being a son to a brother in his tribe. And as a brother, he can be a part of the warrior class mm. and he can also change his name. And so he's like, yo, I got to do this. And it's a story about this kid who's wanting to be a good guy who is a good guy. And he's, he's successful at being a good guy. Mm. He's not a bad hero. He's not a guy who has he's got all these problems, but he's coming up, you know, it, no, he's actually like his his problems are how do I do better? Like I just want to be a, a good I want to be friendly and kind. I want to help people. You know, so the idea of that, and then of course, you know, I, I read a lot of fantasy and science fiction, so there's a lot of action and scary moments and they're being chased and this other stuff. But the 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 main idea is to allow children to re identify with a character that desires something that is not simply revenge or like there's a there's a there's a plot line in the story where the tribe has got to make a decision about going to war or not and before he left Timo was very interested in war because war is where you get glory and mm. I was like yeah but some things happen and you know maybe maybe his perspective changes mm. um but I, I think writing a story about society with a character that's um a kid who is trying to navigate the society mm. um wow. is a lot of freedom and you know this is a this is Maryland in 80 years after big tragedies take place. So it's okay. a dystopian novel. It's, it's set here. Um, but it's, a, and, and of course, Timo is a black kid. So we have a, a, a black male character who is 
adept with his weapons and, and really good with what he's doing and knows how to take care of himself and protect other people. But he has doubts and he has fears and he wants to be a good guy. His whole yeah. goal is to be a good guy. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, we'll see it by the end of the novel if he, if he actually is a good guy or not. But yeah, huh. um, I, haven't, I don't read that novel. I don't read that story about a black boy often. And I was like, okay, so then I have to write that story about a black boy. Yeah. I, th I think it also speaks to, like you said, character building, particularly when you're dealing with young people. I, I can recall very clearly um, as a young, as a kid, my mother teaching me things around character, right? And, and I'm grateful for it because my mother passed early in my life, but there's some fundamental things that adults are still trying to grasp, maybe some of them not so much, that I was able to get because there was an intentional effort to teach me not just how to wash a dish, but how to be integrity, having have integrity, have be integritous. Yeah. So at that book, when I'm when you're when you're describing it to me, it it, it brings me into the mindset of what an awesome tool to help young people and adults build character, establish, work towards building and expanding character. I, I think that's phenomenal. Yeah, I, 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 um, I remember reading a lot as a child and I remember reading these stories where these characters were, you know, like, I don't know if it was Dungeons and Dragons or Dragonlance novels or something, but they, they were kind of like classified as good or, right. or, um, right. oh, it, wasn't, it wasn't just good. It was like, um, uh, oh, it was in there. <laughs> there's a, there's a phrase, there's a, I can't remember it, but it was like, they're either good or neutral or chaotic. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and, and that was clear, like their behavior, like, you know, the chaotic people are like, oh, they're, you know, they're orcs, they're running around smashes up, burn it down. You know, the good people are like, let's heal them. It was, you know, these really, really, really broad and, and very, um, it was a broad spectrum, but then these very specific, you know, monolithic characters are never going to yeah. break out. Of yeah. I, I, that was a little heavy handed. I thought, I, I always thought it's a bit much, you know, he's not going to be good all the time. Um, I think that starting with a kid who has made a huge mistake, um, and they, and his name is now the liar, like that's what they call him in the tribe that values telling the truth oh, greatly. Truth. Yeah. And so we're starting from a kid who's already made the mistake. Like we've already gone through the flawed part. How do we get to the redemption part? Yeah. How do we get the redemption? Because I think we get stuck in, in storytelling yeah. on, on the, um, the journey to redemption. And then we don't talk about redemption. We just leave it there. And they they ride off into the sunset. Well, what happens next? Do they get married? Like, does he kiss the girl? Like, well, give me the happy part. Like, I want to know. And so this novel, I think, is kind of like, has all the stuff, but we get to a happy part. And there's a happy part. Right. Thing. But the, not just getting to the happy but the journey yeah. of getting there. And that it's a real pursuit. It's a real pursuit. It's not figmented your figmentation it's a real pursuit to um i guess happy ending or again to me i'm learning more and more sometimes the end of a thing you know the destination is awesome but the lessons the growth the lessons is in the journey it's in the process i'm and I got it when i get there you know what i'm saying <laughs> oh, hey, I, i'll tell you just i wrote i finished writing this last year finished writing the first draft right before okay. we had to do the play. So I was going into, I, was, I had to dance in the play. So I had to do all this and it had to be working. I was working. I was like, I'm not going to be able to write. So I had to finish it. I finished it right before a hundred thousand words. Yes. And I was yes. like, my friend was like, you should rewrite it. I was like, what? And I was mad. I was like, oh, she's right. Yeah. Yeah. I should rewrite it. So I've been rewriting it. And so now I'm like 85,000 words um, in, but I'm writing every day. I'm writing every day. So I'm trying to write 3,000 words a day, 4,000 words a day. And if I don't do it on a day, now I get I feel really bad about it, which is what I want. I'm like, yeah, but before I was like, ah, it doesn't matter. But I'm realizing that anything that you want to com complete, you have to do it every day. If you want to do something and be good at something, or you want to be, be, uh, be, be, be excellent at anything you do, you have to do it every day. 
Because if you don't do it every day, you haven't done it. And mm. if you if you don't do it in in six months, you've never done it in your life. What's the point? Wow. So the only way you know you've done it in your life is that day to have done it. That's your marker about your ability. That's your marker about how good a basketball you are. Because you made, you know, 50 free throws in a row. Mm. Every day. You know, wow. that. And so that's the lesson I think that I'm learning from this story. Um, that's a lesson that I'm learning from writing this story. Um, you know, these kids are, these kids are running through this post-apocalyptic crazy world, um, <laughs> get chased by all kinds of adults and, and crazy animals and they're laughing and they're being friends. Um, I model these children after kids that I saw in horrible straits who come to school and just crack up in the lunchroom and just be dying. And then go out and they're running from people because they're trying to steal their sneakers. Like, you know, finding that joy and being resilient, that's kind of what the story's about. Yeah. Um, trusting those people around you, um, you know, trusting those you, you, you care about and those you're willing to roll with, yeah. really having trust and, and fostering. Oof. That. You you stepping on toes, Randy. Wait a minute now, you stepping on toes. <laughs> I hear Angela says, "Ouch! Oh my gosh!" That's what I said to myself too. Ooh, my toes is hurting over here. But I think but, that's an excellent lesson, though. That's an excellent. But point. It, it doesn't even have to. This is the thing. It does, you, we don't. People think a lot of times I got to work out for an hour and a half. I can't do it. Huh. Walk out of your house for ten minutes, and then turn around and go home. Right. You did a twenty minute walk. Yeah. Listen to yeah. your favorite podcast. Like everything is possible. You don't have to take a bunch of time to do it. Just do it every day. Just do something. To, I think someone, one of the mem one of the guests, I can, I'm, I'm, it's escaping me. I'm sure my other co-hosts will know. One of the guests that was on said something of that nature. They were a part of a 365 campaign, basically doing something every day towards your purpose. Every day yes. doing yes. something towards that. That's the concept. Yes. Yes. And it, it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night. Learn a song. You play an instrument, learn a song. Learn a song you haven't played before. Learn it. Take What's a week. Give yourself, yeah. a, <laughs> a finite goal. Give yourself a finite goal. If you want to be, if you're writing, write a chapter a day. Maybe write 500 words a day. Yeah. 500 words is two pages. Type double space. You can do that in a day. Writing a novel. Breaking it up in bite-sized, yes. palatable pieces. Yes. Uh, let me. I want to talk about. I want to ask you this question before we transition because it's actually and it's already an hour. Um, and my segment is called Passion Projects, right? So passion, in one sense of the word, it, it speaks to you know intense enthusiasm, you know intense love, whether that's emotion, you know, towards something. Of course, there's the the. Uh, romantic or sexual passion that we use that term to rep represent that. So, the, but the high intense emotion of enthusiasm, love and care, you know, what would you say? I can ask this question a couple of ways. What would you say is your passion? That, that part of passion, that, that high intense, that makes you, as I like to ask, what, what, makes your heart skip a beat what makes your face hurt from smiling so much because it brings so much joy what is your passion doing what i'm doing <laughs> doing what i'm doing every day i get up i uh um i'm not married i don't have any kids i live by myself um i pretty much do art all day i create all day um, I get up, I will, I usually read a chapter of the Bible in the morning. I will try to walk. I try to walk five miles every day. Um, I'll do that. Come back, make some breakfast. If I remember, usually I do. Um, and then I start to create and I do that all day. And the most high has been kind enough to give me the financial means to do this yeah. and to make money from what I'm doing. So um, my passion is creating. My passion is to oh. make something where there was nothing and now there's something beautiful. Mm. Um, my passion is to share something like music or, or art with, with the kids or, or with, with adults who've never heard it before. And I'm like, that's pretty. Yes, yes, art should be beautiful. Art should touch that part of us that nothing else can touch but beauty. And wow. I know that for a long time, art has been about 
creating a, a reaction from individuals or from people, you know, making, um, making this response, you know, I want people to feel something. You can make them feel happiness because there's beautiful. Why don't we do that? Why don't we focus on that? You know, bring back the romance poets, you know, let's talk, <laughs> you know, let's, let's get into it, you know, stand the code. Let's, let's do that. Looking at beauty for beauty's sake, you know, Keats, let, let's, let's get into that. Um, let, let's create art because it's beautiful, simply because it's beautiful. Mm. Simply because it makes us feel happy, simply because we have joy from this moment. Let's do that. Why don't we do that? Let's do that all the time. Let's make that our purpose. Let's make that our goal to make this world better because we've added something beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's my passion. Wow. That's that's intense. And I and I get it. Let's make something beautiful. Let's 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 bring joy into this moment. And that's something that you get that opportunity to do each and every day and 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 experience that every day. And now it's not like it's not like it's just you just do it easy. It's hard. I have to schedule oh, right. time. Exactly. To think about, okay, by three o'clock I have to write this much. By five I have to write this much. I put myself. I have to be disciplined. I have to do the same thing every day yeah. so that I can function and I can actually complete it. So it's yeah, it's not it's not easy, but nothing that's any good in life is easy. Mm. If it's worthwhile, you're gonna have to work for it. Yeah. And especially when it comes to something like creating where you never master this thing. I'll never master the guitar. I'll never master songwriting. <clears throat> it's never gonna happen. I may be great at it, but I'll never master the thing because mm. there's an infinite amount of knowledge that, that music is. And I have a, a finite mind and a finite amount of time wow. to figure it out. Yeah, 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 got that. This is interesting because you 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 did, you did you have a, a different spin. You're right, a lot of times, particularly I think artists, um, and there's a place for it. I think there's a place for it. But a lot of times artists, you know, there is a place of pain that we often come from, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and in some way it always will weave itself. And even, even for example, a stroke that's painful physically, it's also painful because it's a change in your life and it's shifted. So there's there's the, the push and the pull also of passion. You know very well, I'm sure probably could do apologetic on it, about passion, talking about the, the suffering, right? There's also the word for suffering, the whole uh, passion of Christ, um, which, and, and I'll use another terminology, the push and the pull, the angst that yeah. comes along with, you know, uh, the call. Yeah. What would you say is that part of your passion as it relates to your call? I would say it's the same thing. I'd say that, uh, that pain is beautiful. Mm. There's a, there's an intimate and exquisite beauty to pain. Mm. Only you experience it. Your body is trying to tell you something or your mind is trying to tell you something. And the lesson that you will learn from it will probably outweigh the moment that you're in the pain. So pain, there is a beauty in pain. And so when you can find that moment and you can see in the pain, the beauty, you've, you, you don't, you're not in pain anymore. Beauty can wow. conquer pain. And so, wow. you know, the idea is, I think for me, what creating, like writing a song, I, I've written some really sad songs and that's important because sadness is an emotion that we all have and we all feel. And if I can, through a song, make you feel sad, then I worked a little bit of magic, but I've also enabled you to experience what I was feeling, which is the mystery of, of that moment of art when the person slides into the, the eyes of the artist and is like, I get it, I get it, I can feel it. That's the thing. So yeah, I don't think that pain, I think that passion in its fullest definition, if we're gonna look at all the definitions of it, yeah. yeah, I would say that creating is passionate. I suffer, I suffer when I'm trying to write. I suffer when my fingers hurt because I'm practicing or my hands hurt because I'm practicing. That is a suffering and you're doing that for a purpose. And so it's even more of a noble suffering than wow. simply being hit by, you know, the fortunes of life, you know, this is a suffering that you're willing to go through. This is what, when we really talk about passion, we're kind of equating that with what happened with Jesus. He went yeah. through suffering willingly. The artist goes through suffering willingly. Yeah. Um, and they're experiencing pain. Most artists that I know suffer from depression, suffer yeah. from anxiety, suffer from social issues, OCD, um, all, all these things, because to be an artist means to be able to touch something that is not quite here and understand it uh. and 
try to explain that to everyone. That this is what I, I touched this thing and it's beautiful. Can you, y'all want to see it? They're like, what are you talking? So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of angst in that. I can, yeah. I, I'm the only one who can see the beauty in this painting. I'm the only one who can see this picture. I'm the only one who can see the framing of this shot. And when I do it, what happens now? So there's a lot of angst in the creating, you know, most artists that I know are thinking, they think, oh, you know, I'm not that great at what I'm doing. That's not ever the point. The point is to do it. Because yeah. the, only, the only way greatness comes is when you actually activate it. Greatness <laughs> is from a genetic force. It happens when you're doing it. It doesn't happen when you're thinking about it. So the suffering of and the suffering of art, the suffering of passion, and, and the, the passion in art to fully look at it is yes, there's beauty here, but I have a really sad experience that I'm writing about. There's real pain behind this. And if you can experience the pain, somehow it lifts the burden. Somehow you've touched into something, you understand me as an artist now. And so now we've we've met on this emotional plane. Yeah. With strangers. You know, you don't even know me. You heard my song, you're crying. Okay. We've met on an emotional plane. Now let that emotion drive you. Let that emotion drive you into something beautiful. Create something beautiful with it. Mm. Take the pain. We all have pain. Two things we're guaranteed in life. Pain and death. Those are the only two things we're guaranteed. Everything else is, is something we choose. Everything else is something we're hoping for. Mm. But pain and death, those two things will come without us wanting them or not. It has nothing to do with us. And so we have to learn how to deal with those two things. Yeah. And how to confront them without being afraid of them because yeah. they're eternal moments in this life. Wow. Dude, that that was like a whole word right there. That was like a whole I knew you, I knew you, I knew you could, I knew you would to give a whole breakdown. And I was trying to type in the bullet points, but they're so hefty. So I am guaranteed to watch this program again because like we always say, or people say, we don't even say it, but others have said this is like a master class. Because you're always gonna walk away with some nuggets, some, 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 some golden things that you know maybe may have been forgotten or haven't thought about it that way and can take it with you. And you have definitely been dropping some golden nuggets this evening. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'm going to let you come on for another song. One more question is my because because the host may have questions too, and uh, before I do that and say that, uh, audience members, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll try to get, um, we'll try to uh, get to you. We'll definitely get to you. We got some, we got some fans for Mister Mister Preston over. We love Randy. <laughs> um, so, um, you you have um, uh, every now and again, I meet I meet people who seem to have walked in a creative confidence, as I like to call it, for very much part of their life. My, my, when I think about my journey, not that you're saying it was void of uncertainty, but I, I remember just, just like, I can't do this, but having to really and still work through that. But when I listen to your story, um, I hear this history, this rich history um, of creative confidence, whether... Uh, poured into you from family and loved ones, uh, experiences from your environment. You, you have a great appreciation. Some some people will be like, ah, this was horrible, but you seem to have a great appreciation for your diverse experiences. Um, but everyone doesn't get those opportunities, but they, but you know, their journey is different. How would you, or what would you say to emerging creatives as it relates to um, whether getting started or continuing or expanding their creative confidence? What would you say or to emerging creatives? Um, I would say what I said before, mm -hmm. if you want to be good at something, you have to do it every day. If you want to perform, if you want to, um, if you want to perform in front of a crowd, the reason that you, that, so I'm doing, I should talk about this. I'm doing a, a thing at the Kennedy Center um, called a uh, songbook. And what's happened is some kids have written poems based on books they liked. Mm. And then they come up and meet me and we write a song together about the book. Awesome. Um, and uh, one of the things I said to the kids is, if you want to be good at something, the reason that we're going to practice it a lot 
is that when we get up, we just don't mess up. Because if you mess up in, with, with a song, that means that whatever magic you were trying to share has been interrupted. And every time you practice, you become more confident. So if you want to be creatively confident, do the thing every day, because that that's the only way you're ever going to get confident in what you're doing. If you want to be confident in shooting a jump shot, practice shooting the jump shot a lot. If you want to be confident at, um, at, at writing poetry, write a poem every day, write two poems a day, write one in the morning, one at night, every day. Even if it's just three lines or five lines, even if you're just writing a bunch of haiku for a year, do it every day. And at the end, look at what you have created. See what you've created and it will be something beautiful. Um, confidence comes from repetitions. Confidence comes from having done it so many times, your nervousness does not get in the way of your presentation. Mm. That's how you become excellent in presenting whatever it is you're presenting. And most of the time, uh, even with something like art, and I'm getting into art a little bit, I'm trying to start to paint. So okay. I'm like, yeah, and I'm, I'm taking a lot of pictures. I'm not very good at it, but I'll do it a lot. I'm just going to keep doing it because one of the, I think this is also something that I would add. In order to be creatively confident, you have to be willing to fail. Mm. You have to absolutely suck at whatever you're doing. You've got to be terrible at it. Yeah, <laughs> you can't accept being bad at something. You'll never be prepared to be great at it. Right. So you have to start every day. You should do something that you're not good at. Just so you're in that right place of always being being in that place of learning, always wow. having your mind open to accept other things, to learn, to be taught, to be teachable. There's a humility that comes with being that comes with being a really, really, really good teacher mm. or really really good whatever there's a humility because everyone understands well, mm. mo a lot of people understand that when you get to a high level of doing something you may be the best around but there's always someone better and you yeah. can always learn and so yeah the confidence that you want to have when you're creating is the confidence that comes from doing something over and over again um yeah practice is not practice doesn't make you a master the thing. It just makes you be able to do the thing, the mo the fine motor movements. You can just do it better. That's it. You're just more confident in doing it. You won't forget. You yeah. won't slip. You won't mess up. Now I'm, I'm equating that to the guitar because I'm playing, I have a guitar in my lap, but um, anything, anything that you want to be good at, anything that you want to be confident at either presenting or sharing or, 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 or talking about or showing, you have to do it a lot. You got to do it every day. Yeah. That's the only way you're going to be better. Wow. Ask my, ask my, ask any of these athletes because we we take their word for these things. We can say, oh yeah, if I want to be a better soccer player, I'll do what Cristiano Ronaldo does and and practice more than. Me. Okay, yeah, that's that's the truth. You want to be better than Jordan? Do a Kobe Bryant. Learn everything Jordan did and practice as hard, if not harder. That's the only way to do it. You got to do it every day. You got to be on the grind, and that's the suffering. That's yeah. the grind. That's the yeah. sacrifice. That's why when, you know, people get up and they're getting Grammys, they're crying, they're crying. They're thinking about those nights they were in the basement and everyone else was asleep and they were working on that thing. They were trying to figure that song out and they were, they were crying and cursing and mad and kicking stuff around. It's not right. That's suffering. That's real suffering. That's real. When, when you do the thing a lot. Yeah. Because if you don't do it enough, you don't care enough about it. Hmm. That's awesome. Hmm. Wow. I have three questions. It's my whimsical. This is my whim, whimsy and wonder section. And then I'm going to let you sing another song for us or share a poem or whatever you so desire. So if you had the choice and you may have done both of these, I don't know, quite honest. I'm gonna have to, I'm have to pick some other questions now, I'm thinking depending on my on my guest. <laughs> but would you rather jump out jump out of the plane? or into an icy river would you rather which one would you rather i um i'm kind of traditional in the sense that i like the idea of flying okay. and i like the idea of going up and then landing too i like that in the plane though like i want to be in the plane when it lands okay and the idea of jumping out doesn't make sense to me it's like why would we do this <laughs> this is the reason you have a plane is to get in it and get to the plane like why am i jumping because you can now? fly 
not you be in a vehicle, but you could fly. That concept of feeling like you can fly. Yeah, I'll be flying everywhere. I'll be all over the place. But if I can't fly, no, thank you. Give me a river. I'll take the river. <laughs> take the river. Okay. I, I, yeah. When I was, uh, huh? I was 16, we were on the, we were trying to climb Mount Kenya. We'd gone up there um, with a school, school trip, and there was this glacier fed pond. We all jumped into it. Mm. And it was the coldest thing I've ever been in. And I couldn't even scream. But I didn't need to wear a jacket or a sweater for the rest of the trip. I was warm. All of us, everyone who jumped in, we were like, yo, dude, it's hot. And everyone else is like shivering. So icy streams wow. are really good. Wow. Yeah, I, that's a mind of a matter thing. I, I despise cold, but I'm also scared of heights. So I, I still don't know what my own answer would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not sure. What does it... Um, thing would be better, right? Because you're not going to fall. Again? Right. If you can fly, you're not going to fall. You know, the thing about heights is that you're going to fall. Like, I don't want to fall. I don't like heights. Yeah, but see, I think even even like a bird that's pushed out of the nest to learn to fly, they fall. And then you have to, hey. you know. Yes, yes. So, and even I have never done it, but, you know, even the fall from a plane, there is a fall before you catch air, so to speak. Right. right? right. So all of that. Since my heart is, <laughs> no, but, but, I, but you're speaking to the the idea of failure. Yeah, exactly. You're speaking to the idea of failure again. Okay. Like you bring that back around. Yeah, you have to be in a place where you're falling, where exactly. you are not in control. I did a I did a piece, um, or I shared some some words, uh, one time around. Um, I forgot the title, but. I made an analogy of um, sometimes you, the, the the deeper the dip. So I used to dance and of course a plie, there's a grand plie, there's a plie and there's a grand plie. So the deeper dip gives you more leverage for the leap, but but the deeper, the, the further down you go, right? And it was so revelatory to me, but that's a part of the process. We don't, I don't like to fall. I don't wanna fail. I don't wanna look crazy. These things, these limitations, they are the limitations to the to the success because you have to have those experiences first. So, you know, you're 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 on on the point, on the money right there. Okay, so with these next three words, again, this is my whimsy and wonder questions. Don't think too deeply about it. You know, let your deep mind go. <laughs> Whatever the first word is that comes to your mind when I say this word. All right. Passion. Um, the first thing that came to my mind when you said that was passion fruit. Okay, when I was there a you kid, go. Yeah, when I was a kid, we had this yogurt and had passion fruit. I was like, this is great. A yes, yogurt passion. passion fruit, and I don't think I've ever had yogurt with passion fruit. Nah, this was in England. They had a lot of weird stuff in their yogurt. Oh, man. Yeah, that sounds delicious, though. It was amazing. And they had little chunks of passion fruit. I was like, okay. oh, that sounds delicious. That's what I want. That was, that that was the good news. We, get the get it. It was good. <laughs> we gotta find some. Okay, purpose. Purpose. Um, You think it too long, whatever first comes to your mind, boom. Serving, serving, serving. Like, I was, yeah, yeah, purpose and service are the same thing to my mind. Okay. Um, because again, if we're thinking about purpose in relation to calling, then you see a need, it's serving you, you're gonna feel it, whatever. Even if even if you're being a football coach or even if you're being a, a news anchor, but you saw the need and you filled it, you are serving because that's oh, your intention. Serving a purpose, yeah. Yeah. Pink Panther. Um. Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, funny, funny. If you had a billboard uh -huh. that was dedicated to your words, okay. this billboard would remain long past you being alive and on the earth. What would your billboard say? Be kind. Be loving. Be honest. Be authentic. That's what I would say. Be kind, be loving, be honest, be authentic. Ladies and gentlemen, Randy Preston, let's hear another piece from you. Sure. Do you want a poem or a song? Whatever, Whatever you feel moved to do is up to you. Um, okay. I have a poem, but I don't know if it, it might be a little lengthy, but uh, I'm going to read a poem because I never read this poem. I, don't, I, I never, I read this once on a, on a, uh, <laughs> on a podcast. Or a uh, uh, radio show, and uh, I've never read it again. But I'm laughing because the radio show was very intense. I didn't know it was 
His brother's very, very intense. I was like, oh, okay. And then I read my poem. And I was like, I like it. Man. These guys are serious. Um, let me see if I can right. find it here. Yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. The poem is called, uh, this is a poem. <clears throat> this is called Success is Relative. Um, a friend of mine was going through some changes in his life and I felt like he was selling out and I became angry. And this is kind of like an explosion of that. He's been successfully promoted to lifelong misery, wealthily, miserly, bargaining furiously to attain aristocracy, trying to bend stealthily his vision's bright progeny into dulled shapes, uniformly refusing to offend the company, conform the ideology, avoid dissension carefully, arduously, remakes a personality, parenting in thoughts constantly, fights altruism gleefully, it might morph dangerously into truth too convincingly, which may unacceptably alter pH, past neutrality, disturb the tepid ecstasy of spit warm me mediocrity, new dubbed meritocracy, reflectively, Euro trash obsessively, model of new equality, recants origin publicly, devalues strange ethnicities, treating them like foreign currencies, one for you, ten for my nationality, interest free, progressively, spouts a token testimony of moving upward bootlessly, pedals downward motility maliciously, shading light deviously, mortgage weighs so heavily, recycles hidden slavery, de emancipates so silkily, hope slumps deferred infinitely. Junk food poisons effectively, sugar high, obesity overconsumed pathetically, slam the ball athletically, future concuss for loyalty, imperialistically exacerbates misogyny, simply behaving naughtily, boys act like boys will normally, a good white male is the oddity, a bigoted not, just our history, use genocide mercilessly, turn profit via industry, rape brutally, slay eagerly, the beauty of the plural we, escaping culpability, anonymously. Colorblind ostensibly, blindfolded pursue recklessly, red-green spectrum only, registers chromatically, claret-drenched shrubbery, precious metal verdigris, golden grin smirks breathlessly, life prolonged al alchemically, unprecious stones gleam eerily, moldy bull feeds greedily, horrifically, subsisting vampirically, gaze over ever outward hungrily, imbibes innocence speedily, black fossils sucked up bloodily, calf worshipped religiously at Wall Street's altar openly, temple for nobility, lucre-loving orthodoxy, protect, protected vigilantly, midnight blues serve faithfully, universally, town criers toss bites daintily, ignoring deadly poverty, in medias rest histrionically, overwhelm the lies with scrutiny, deride the fallibility of two parties' democracy, remixed feudal equality, proselytize never-endingly, while staunch believers rapturously declare its merits nasally, apparently administer triumphantly last rites of social parity. Rest in peace, middle-class autonomy, liquidation funds oligarchy, peasants bankroll new monarchy, which belches toxin wantingly, prevaricates with certainty, well-debunked mythology of eugenic superiority solidifies their enmity scientifically and ever so haughtily from dreams of racial purity self-publishes divinity accessible and conscious free of boring old theology i am struggling financially to find my destiny frantically pursuing so-called fantasies of rock sought authenticity and unstintingly refusing the calumny of binding generalities categorically reject labels philosophically Attempt responses logically, arrogantly, prescribe standards viciously, declare what I am meant to be, presume my purpose banally, while I pleadingly, anxiously, trustingly, prayerfully request respectively revelation, imagery I was born to breathe, stories I was formed to speak, concepts to explain how freely they and I can see clearly into creativity, transforming effortlessly emotions empathetically, Mixed music and morphology, confessing the complexity of the task eternally thrust upon me personally, being grown in me naturally. An ancient biology, a love-filled bibliography, a map-less oceanography, an uncharted geography, a spoken word ethnography, a living etymology, a visible phonology, a humanoid orthography, confidently ascending surprisingly through creation's memory, transfigured by the energy that cradles me lovingly, the I am received humbly, reflected through me honestly unique to me, wholly desired unilaterally, immolating finally homicidal proclivities, Adam's genetic frailty, the belief I need to just do me, earnestly announcing the best part of me holistically, exists through true servility, 
release to ride the tendency to spread to all humanity gossip of love's possibility. Amazingly, through one who sacrificially claimed empathetically, know me, experience who you can be. Thank you. Your mic is off. Sorry about that. Thank you, thank you for that. That's I I was um over here quietly cheering because there was a word that you used, merit meritoc meritocracy. Come on in, co-host. Um, which was one of the words on my words on Wednesdays um, writing prompt some years ago, and um. I was like, ah, oh, I've never heard anyone else use it. Do I need to add you guys? Hello, I'm back. <laughs> How did you get all them allergies? You looked in the dictionary and got all the allergies. Oh, you know what? I, I was mad. I was angry. I just was angry. I was like, I can let me see how many of these I can put in here. And so it's a lot. It's a lot. I, when I read it, I was like, dang, this is a lot of ease. Yeah, but yes. I think I, I scoured uh, the dictionary probably. I said that know. was groovy. <laughs> groovy, yes, perfect. So my question, uh, Randy, first off, amazing interview. I love uh, definitely hearing you talk about being a multi-creative as I, because I am as well. You, you mentioned um, scheduling time every day to practice whatever discipline you're working on. Do you create time every day to do everything or do you say, okay, this is my creative time. And then when you get to that time, decide what you're going to work on. I, I do everything every day. Um, okay. I'm writing a lot. I'm, I'm writing like a, a lot right now. Um, and it's, it, it, start, it's, it starts to get tiring um, because I have given myself a pretty large word goal. And when you're writing like three, four thousand words, seven days a week, that I, it's yeah, it's it's a little wild. Mm -hmm. So the only way that I'm I found that I can continue to do that is to disperse that writing with other creative things. So mm. I'll paint, um, I, I paint these little mini these little miniatures um, for this tabletop war game. Um, I will play video games. I think video games are really fertile. Um, ground for art for artistic people because especially I, I play RPG so you can be in a world where you understand all the rules and you can sell or not where you can you know you kind of have a lot of control and as an artist you don't really have much control so that I like that um I uh I will write I'll play my guitar I'll sing um and I'll do those every day I have to do those every day um for even if I'm playing my if I play two songs before I go to bed um, or if I just play some scales. Uh, right now, I'm working on some projects. So musically, I'm doing a lot of music, but or generally, I'm doing a lot of music. But um, now, if I was working on, there's another project that I'll be I'll be writing some songs for, um, and that's a pretty lengthy project. So when I'm doing that, my focus will be those songs, and I'll be writing 500 words a day. I'll be doing, okay. you know, mm -hmm. I, I won't as much probably or maybe i'll you know pay for an hour instead of two hours but the idea is to i don't know i, I think that the idea of mass jack of all trades master of none it always annoyed me as a kid i was like why why you, nobody's ever going to master everything so why don't you do be able to do a bunch of stuff you know gordon park showed us we can do that i want to be gordon parks you know <laughs> i like that answer thank you like i said because i I write, I sew, and try, you know, making time for both. Now again, as, as I said, I have the, the luxury of having to only feed myself every day. And so <laughs> Same. it changes the game. It, it literally, it absolutely changes the game. So right now I'm in a place where I'm doing as much as I can, and, and I'm kind of overdoing it maybe, mm -hmm. um, but I'm doing as much creating as I can because I know at some point I will not be in the same place that I am now and right. the opportunity will not be here. So I'm, I'm trying to write as much as I can. So that, that, that's, and, and again, this is not a normal 
situation for most people. So when I'm saying, you know, doing something every day, you know, maybe you don't, maybe you don't uh, play music for half an hour. Maybe you just do it for 10 minutes. You know, maybe you do say, maybe you, maybe you do say, like you were saying, you know, do you come to the creative moment and say, what am I going to do in this time? Um, you know, what I would suggest maybe is to, if you're, if you're going to do that model where you have a, a set block of time, mm-hmm. choose the thing you are most interested in doing, do that at the beginning and at the end, and then in the middle, do something else. Because okay. that will give you a really good sense of- Break it up, yeah. Yeah, breaking up the thing, and you're able to come back to it with some, some fresh eyes um, and some fresh emotions. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the idea of being a creative is being creative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Why not? Like that, that's the thing I always ask people. I'm like, why not? Well, I want to write a book. Why have you done it? Ah, I don't have the time. Fifteen minutes a day. Just do it every day for fifteen minutes. That's all. It it it. it I don't know. I don't. Know. I feel like I have a cousin who um has made this amazing weight loss transformation. Has changed his life. <laughs> He's, and I get it. He's always talking about it. He's like, gotta do it, yeah, because it's it's simply that you gotta do it every day, whatever it is. If you do it every day, in six months you'll be like, dang, I really got a lot of this done, or I know how to do it more, or I figured it out. And again, you know, like I was saying earlier, you get stronger. Not yeah. good at creatively too. If you're not and you build your discipline muscle too. Mm-hmm. Give it a shot. Yeah. Fail to fail every day. Do something that you suck at every day, mm-hmm. because it will give you a greater appreciation for the great things you can do. Mm. Other areas. Yeah, use a little bit of your lunch time, use your car time. Yeah, all, the, all of that works. I talk about this in workshops. All of that works. Speak terribly and get better at it. Learn an African language. Learn Swahili. Learn tree. You know, like, there it is. you know, just do it. Like, it, it, life is the only thing we take from this life, I believe, are the memories. Or the experiences that we have, you don't remember all the bad pain. You, you, you don't. That's women wouldn't have multiple kids if they remembered all the pain. Um, but they, you know, <laughs> pain, pain it has to, because trust me, uh, like I have my mom was like, yeah, there's no way I do it again. But she had, you know, three of us. So at some point, you know, you forget that. Um, you remember the experiences. You remember how people made you feel, and you remember how peop- you made other people feel when they tell you that. Like that is a big part of it. People tell you how they how you make them feel. And those are the things in this life that are important. How are you loving people? How are you making, when you walk away from the interaction, are they feeling happy? Are they glad you were there? Do they want you to come back? Mm. True. So what's gonna happen when you don't have that, that space, when it's not just feeding you? Like how do you, how are you gonna maneuver through that when? It, there it, are other it, things. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I when, there are other, when there are other things and other people, when you're not just feeding yourself because you know that's going to change. How do you maneuver? How do you um, plan to maneuver through that? I don't know. Um, my parents were here uh, in March. They were here in Maryland. They live in Florida. Um, they were here. And uh, my dad had COVID, and so we all got it. And I was trying to, you know, I'm running up and down the stairs. My parents, my dad's 82, my mom's 76. So they're mobile, but they were sick. And I'm running up and down, I'm doing so. I didn't write for like three weeks. It was not, it was not even possible. So I was like, oh, okay. I got to figure out this, this, this area, this, this moment. Um, I'm not in that moment now. Um, I think that one of the things that's helped me, especially when I was teaching, to be able to complete the stuff that I wanted to do, I would just get up early in the morning. I like doing that. I like getting up in the morning. I like watching the sunrise if I can. So sometimes I live near a couple of ponds, a couple of lakes. <clears throat> so sometimes I'll drive down there, take some pictures and come back and write, you know, before six o'clock or before seven o'clock. Um, again, it's always a sacrifice. It's a, it, it's a sacrifice. Um, something is going to, you have 24 hours a day, something's gonna have to give. But if you can, if you can find, Changing the idea of practicing something from it being an onerous task to something you're looking forward to helps mm-hmm. with that. All right, Respect. The idea of practice. I know when I was when I was learning to play the guitar, I was in college, and my dad taught me all the chords I needed to know to, to learn a song, but I didn't know anything else. So my teacher was like, "You gotta learn." And I was 
trying to practice. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to, it was, it's, I didn't want to spend all the time. Like I, I was fumbling with stuff. It was horrible. And so I was like, I got to do it. And I kept doing it every day. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not do it well. And it's okay to not have enough space or time. If you can do it every day, you will be, you will increase and you'll become better. Um, whatever masteries that you're trying to attain. So even if it's five minutes, if it's 10 minutes, if it's 25 minutes, taking that time out. And I think I'm going to have to figure that out. Like, where does that time come? Where do I take it from? Do I take it from my morning, my evening? Um, do I write before I go to bed? I have some friends who write before they go to bed. And they'll, they'll, they'll take half an hour and just write another chapter before they go to sleep. Um, I don't know, the answer was all over the place. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was a good answer. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? Uh, I, don't, I, don't think I, I don't think I see any in the chat. Just a bunch of compliments, but no, no questions. Yes, a lot of love for this interview. I'm going to ask a question I ask to the musicians on my interview. Um, there's actually two. Okay. So the first one is uh, the best concert venue you know is set up for you. Who do you want to see on that oh, stage, much. Any, living or dead? Who do I want to see playing with me, or I'm just I'm there as a as a. You're there as an audience member. As an audience member. And it's your show. It's your show. Yes. You want you want to you want it's your act. Whatever you want. Wow, whatever I want. Um, that's a really. Living or dead. I want my. I want to hear my dad and my uncle sing. Mm. Their voices are great. I mean, I sound a little bit like them, but I don't. I don't come close to it. Um, I'd want to hear my mom and her sisters and my uncle and them. They sing in this big choir. I want to hear that. I want to hear them. Um, I would want to hear. Uh, just my favorite. My favorite artists would be. I'd want Michael Franks to be there. I'd want um, Fred Hammond to be there. I would want uh, um, Michelle and Degas Cello to be there. Um, I would want uh, Gregory Porter to be there. Mm. I would want this guy named Nako Bear to be there. Um, oh man, who else? This, oh, there's a there's a, a a Swedish group. I can't remember their name. Um, I'd want them to be there. Take six, uh, absolutely. They'd have to be there. Um, Johnny Mathis. Uh, mm. <laughs> oh, what's the guy's name? Oh, oh, uh, Barry Manilow. Barry Manilow brought some good songs, yo. That he is true. Beast. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, you, uh, I'd want, it, I'd want Rage Against the Machine there. Like, I want Green Day there. Like, those, those are bands from what I was like, yes. But I love that answer. I love the answer because it definitely shows a range. Because I know somebody who would probably have a lineup like that. So the second question is, as a musician, who would you like to perform with? Oh, man, who I'd like to perform with? Um, as a musician, I'd like to perform with most deaf. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'd like to perform with John Mayer. Yeah, mm. um, I'd like to perform with B.B. King. BB King, man. Wow. Or uh oh um Miles Davis Quintet, yes, please. I'm not that great at jazz, but I'll jam with y'all like, oh my god, I'm like yes. <laughs> um I like playing with my dad. I love playing with my dad. He's a great musician. Um I have a gr a group of, of older men who are my dad's age and my dad's friends. I'd love to play with those guys. I just don't think I can. So I can hang. They're just that great. Yeah, Uncle awesome. Reggie. Yeah. Awesome. I love that answer. I love that answer. I will kick it to Girl Genius. Thank you. It was a great question. Thank you. All I have left, because you guys have asked the questions I actually wanted to ask, which is great. Like mm -hmm. we were all on the same page, question wise. Um, all I have left is that last question. We it's the hardest. One, it's, I ask one question at the end of every show, okay. and I promise you, it's the hardest question you'll answer all night. Well, you know that Billboard question is like you answered it, but that Billboard question that, that this guy and be asking is a little hard too, though. That's a little. <laughs> it is a little hard. That is loaded. 
That's a little that's a loaded question. So is the concert one. That's also a very loaded question, yeah. depending on who you're asking. Mm -hmm. But this is the hardest question to answer all night. Okay. All right. Are we ready? Like, steal yourself. Drum roll. Okay, so now that we've been on the show, and I'll, I'll run a quick reminder of like the segments we have. Uh, the one you're on is uh, Passion Projects. Kennedy has posts and platforms. I have lots. Let's talk about the book. And um, Sherry has From Behind the Microphone. So you know the segments. You've been on the show. Who, whose brain do you want to pick? Who do you think would make a good guest on this show? Any segment. Um, right. Jason Reynolds. I was thinking that this morning. I'm about to text Jason. Where is my phone? I was thinking that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I, I, this I don't know. I don't know why I didn't think about Jason this morning. This is, this is dope. I'm mad at myself for not this having had Jason on the list earlier. Yeah, call Jason. Please do. You haven't had him? Jason or Kwame is a no. great no. Kwame is a great cool. I just know Kwame is mad busy right now. Kwame. So I don't know about his schedule. Kwame Alexander. Yeah, yeah, yeah we stuff. haven't had Jason and we haven't had Andrew, and Jason wasn't even on the list and I'm mad at myself for not thinking. Right. Right. Jeff, that, that, he should have been on the list. Another great interview. Leah Henderson's another great interview. Okay. I don't mm -hmm. know Leah Henderson. He is a great writer. Kids books, awesome. Oh, perfect! I love it. These are all these are all writers. Did you want me like? No, music? no writers. No. Whoever. Whoever. Doesn't matter. I would also Mark Meadows. He was the musical director for the show. He was the orchestrator for the show that I did when we did at the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. He plays with a lot of. He's a, he's an up and coming composer, jazz performer. He's an he has a uh, a group. He's amazing. Mark Meadows, check him out. Mark Meadows. I, I promise you, I was even, I was texting you guys this morning, just this morning, and I kept saying certainly they've had Jason because jeez. No, awesome. but I'm going to pick Jason as soon as I get off. If the phone was right here, I would take. You know, I'm not, if you make that happen. Uh, I would suggest a round table. table. Uh, yep, I would say we have a round table spot. You gotta coming. have a round table for you. New coming up. I'm not just giving up, Jason. <laughs> that's that's an excellent interview. Um, that's are, funny. What are, oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, no, did, I was just laughing. Well, we didn't ask this question, which is important. And that's why I put in your um your cash app as well, uh, yes. which is. How can people support you? Not necessarily. I mean, it can be it can be financial, you know, books or whatever. But how would you? What are some of the ways people can support you? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, one of my former students is helping me get my social media and stuff together because it's terrible. He was like, uh, you know, press this. Is, this is. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, okay. Let's let's work. So I'm supposed to start talking today. <laughs> Um, so I, I honestly don't know. Uh, I have a website. You can go on my website, make comments, um, yeah. talk to me there. Um, I have a blog with some of my poetry on it. Um, yeah, the website is readypressing.com. Check that out. Um, I'm going to be, you know, the, the books are coming out. So the books I'm working, I wrote a book with Kwame, um, called how to sing a song. And I think that comes out next year. Um, so just keep your eyes open for those and then come, you can come support the show, um, in January at the Kennedy center. If you're in this area, um, yeah. bring your children, they will love it. Um, the, yeah, the show is, it's awesome. I, I really like, it. I haven't seen it yet. So I'm not actually right as of now, I'm not in the show. So I get to actually watch it for the first time because I've never actually seen it, um, fully performed without being ridden with angst about my performance. So I'll be able to <laughs> enjoy it. Like, yeah, it is great. It is awesome. Um, yeah, I'll be, um, putting some music out. I'm, I just got a, a Twitch account and one of my, uh, tribal elders, one of the, one of the, uh, the tribe is helping me do that. So I'll be, um, making some, uh, making some, uh, announcements on my Facebook page and my Instagram page. So follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook awesome. or, or add me for whatever it is on Facebook, add me as a friend on Facebook. Um, yeah, that's the best ways to support me. Just pray for I, me. Keep how can you support me. me? I don't know. Let me tell you, you can come to the show. You can support <laughs> the program. You can come to the website. You can come to the Kennedy Center in January if you're local. You know, you, but I don't know how you can support me, but you know, follow me on Facebook and then go to my Twitch. And then, you know, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Lord. Okay. So
So first thing we're going to do is let's everyone please give a huge round of applause virtually and in person to our special guest this evening, Randy um, Weston. Thank you for joining us. We really yes, appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you for having me and for having this space that we can talk about these things. These are awesome questions. I felt like um, I was learning from the questions and as a teacher, I really, I really appreciate that. Awesome. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank That's you. really good. We will be back next Sunday with From Behind the Microphone, which if you were here at the beginning, you know, is hosted by me. And I am bringing a really special poet artist from the DMV. His name is Jonathan B. Tucker. He, uh, Yes, we have JBT next week. So please come back 7 p.m. next Sunday. Uh, follow and subscribe and like on YouTube, Facebook, wherever, you know. Start I'm with the start with the start with the YouTube and the Facebook pages because those where the that's where the live show stream. Um, yes. I will definitely have this interview up. All our interviews stay up, and I'm I'm definitely going to um, post about the again following to catch the podcast too. If you missed the show and you want to come back and listen to it, that'll be up as well. Yes, definitely. So um, everyone, please stay safe, wash your hands, stay healthy. We will see you all again next Sunday. Goodbye.